Thanks very much, Al, and thanks for the invitation. I always like to speak to ag audiences because you guys are out there every day growing our food, and I'm very thankful for that. We've got a lot to cover today. We're going to cover agriculture, human health, and the environment. But first, let me give you a little story about where I'm from. This is where I grew up for my first 14 years on a little float camp on the northwest tip of Vancouver Island in the rainforest by the Pacific. There was no road to this little village. I had to go to school by boat every day. And when the road came, we thought the place would expand. Half the people used the road to get out. <laughs> so that's where I started. At age 14, because there was no school past that, I was sent to boarding school in Vancouver, where I soon learned city ways, ending up eventually at the University of British Columbia studying the life sciences, biochemistry, genetics, biology, a little forestry, which is the industry I, and the environment that I grew up in. And then in the mid-60s, before the word was even known to the general public, I discovered the science of ecology, the science of how all living things are interrelated and how we are related to them. It was the height of the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and the threat of all-out nuclear war, and the newly emerging consciousness of the environment. I enrolled in a PhD in ecology and was soon transformed into a radical environmental activist. Can't seem to get it to go that way anymore. <laughs> I, found, I found myself in a church basement with a like-minded group of activists planning a protest voyage against U.S. nuclear testing in Alaska. We proved that a somewhat ragtag-looking bunch, that's me under the P in 1971, could sail an old fish boat across the North Pacific, provide a focal point for media attention to opposition to the tests, and help change the course of history. When that H-bomb was set off in November 71 at Amchitka Island in the Aleutians, it turned out to be the last hydrogen bomb the United States ever detonated. There were more atomic tests after that, but President Nixon, at the height of the Cold War, canceled the remaining H-bomb tests. Flushed with victory, we were welcomed into the big house of the Quag Youth Nation at Alert Bay near my northern Vancouver Island home, where they made us brothers of the tribe. For this began the tradition for Greenpeace of the Warriors of the Rainbow, which we learned from those people, about how when the birds fall dead and the sky is poisoned and the water too and life is in trouble, that people around the world will join together to save the environment. We named our ship the Rainbow Warrior and I spent the next 15 years full time in the top committee of Greenpeace campaigning around the world. We next took on French atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific. France was still detonating atomic and hydrogen bombs in the air in the early 1970s, sending radiation around the Southern Hemisphere. They were a little more difficult. It took years to drive these nuclear tests underground, and as late as 1985, under direct orders from President Mitterrand, French commandos bombed and sank the Rainbow Warrior in Auckland Harbor, killing our photographer. The campaign continued till long after I left Greenpeace, it wasn't until the mid-90s that nuclear testing finally ended in most parts of the world, including the South Pacific. Going back 10 years to 75, here I'm driving a small rubber boat into the first encounter with the Soviet factory whaling fleet. You can see the whales tied up to the side of the harpoon boat and about to go up that hole up to the deck to be cut up. We put ourselves in front of their harpoons in our little rubber boats to protect the fleeing whales. This got us on TV all around the world, bringing the Save the Whales movement into everyone's living room for the first time. Just four years later, factory whaling was banned in the North Pacific and by 1981 in all the world's oceans. And since then, there has been a miraculous recovery of whale populations around the world. Here I'm sitting on a baby seal off the east coast of Canada to protect it from the Hunter's Club. I was arrested and hauled off to jail. The seal was clubbed and skinned, but this picture appeared in over 3,000 newspapers around the world the next morning. This and many other direct actions made changes to the way Canada manages its seal herds. Anyways, that's just a thumbnail of 15 years. And why did I leave Greenpeace after le helping lead it for that long? There's a number of ways of explaining it. At an at a overarching level, 
we began with a very strong humanitarian orientation in the early years of Greenpeace to save human civilization from all-out nuclear war. By the time I left in the mid-80s, the peace had kind of been dropped off and all there was left was the green and now humans were depicted as the enemies of nature, the enemies of the earth. I couldn't live with that kind of thinking. I know that we, the species Homo sapiens, is descended from all the rest of life just like every other species is. We're part of nature. We evolved on this planet along with all the other species. So telling our kids that humans are evil and nature is good and that humans are the enemies of nature as if we came from some other planet as an invasion is really not a very good thing to teach them. It's really a very destructive kind of thinking and it's also wrong. The other thing, the sort of sharp end of the stick, was on a specific policy issue my fellow directors of Greenpeace International, none of whom had any science education, that wasn't their fault, they were activists and such, but you need some science when you're going to talk about toxics and chemicals and you know, genetics and all of these science subjects. And they decided that because dioxin, DDT, and PCBs are all chlorinated hydrocarbons, that the common denominator was chlorine and therefore we should ban chlorine worldwide. I'm going like, maybe you guys don't know that chlorine is one of the elements in the periodic table. You know, it's one of the building blocks of the universe, the 11th most common element in the Earth's crust. And besides which, it is also the most important for element for human health and medicine, for public health. And this again highlights the fact that they don't really care about people very much because they didn't care about that. Adding chlorine to drinking water is the biggest advance in the history of public health and our swimming pools and spas. And most of the synthetic pharmaceuticals we produce are with chlorine chemistry. Chlorine is important for health precisely because it is toxic to bacteria and other things that are trying to kill us. But they have this naive vision today of a world without toxics. Everything is going to be clean and non-toxic. That doesn't work in the field of medicine and public health. So I had to leave. Forests is my favorite subject because they are home to the majority of all species on Earth and they provide the most important renewable resource for both material and energy. There's nothing else like it. It's wood. And yet today, most environmentalists are opposed to cutting trees, basically. They think that cutting the forest is destroying the forest, when in fact it produces the most important renewable resource, and what we should be doing is growing more trees and using more wood. But they give people the idea that if you buy lumber, you're causing a forest to be lost somewhere, when what you're actually doing is sending a signal for landowners to plant more trees to supply the demand. If you look around the world, you will see it's where people use the most wood, that forests are stable and growing, most of the wealthy countries, and India and China now, because they're getting wealthier, are increasing their area of forest, whereas the countries that don't use wood for building, take Haiti as a perfect example, where they build their houses out of substandard concrete, and then it falls on their head in an earthquake, they have almost no forests left because there's no demand for wood. If there was, they'd plant trees. And trees grow in a factory called the forest with renewable solar energy, unlike steel, concrete, and plastic, which are made in real factories with huge inputs of energy, usually fossil fuels. There's nothing wrong with those things, but if we maximize wood use, we reduce energy consumption, air pollution, and a whole bunch of other things, and we keep our land forested. Because why would anybody plant trees back on their land if no one wanted wood? I mean, maybe the odd philanthropist. But generally, the reason people grow trees is to supply the market with timber. My province, British Columbia, produces half a billion dollars worth of salmon every year from farms. We also have a huge wild salmon fishery, which is doing really well these days, partly because the salmon farms have provided the fresh fish into restaurants in the United States rather than it having to be wild fish. So it's taken the pressure off the wild fish. 
It also produces the most healthy food in the world, according to nutritionists. The omega-3 fats in salmon are good for our hearts and our brains. And yet Greenpeace and environmentalists in Canada and around the world are dead set against salmon farming, saying it's polluting the ocean and damaging the wild fish stocks, all of which are total made-up lies, when in fact it does a really good service. You can get salmon now in Costco and other supermarkets for way less than you could when all there was was wild salmon. And back then you only got fresh fish for a few months of the year. Now salmon is fresh every day. And I tell you, try the Costco steelhead coming out of the Columbia River farms, and Canada's growing it too. It's one of the best products I've ever tasted. It's not cheap, but then neither is New York steak. It's really good for you too. Yet the leading environmentalist in Canada, Dr. David Suzuki, the geneticist who's against genetics, says, I would never feed a child farm salmon its poison. He's basically telling parents they shouldn't give a healthy food to their child that is now affordable year-round, and, and therefore making them more at risk to uh, health problems, because salmon's healthy. So that's just two aspects of agriculture and forestry, which forestry, of course, is silviculture. I always like to say there's four kinds of culture in this world. There's agriculture, where you grow food on the land. There is silviculture, where you grow trees, forestry. There is aquaculture, where you grow food in the sea. And then there's urban culture, where you grow people. This is a chart of the increasing level of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere. This is almost certainly due mostly to human burning of fossil fuels and some land use change, deforestation for agriculture. But a lot of people think this is scary. And I will show you that you should think the opposite. This is not scary. It should be celebrated. NASA, on the other hand, that gets $1.5 billion a year from the federal government for climate change research, is telling us that CO2 controls the global temperature, as if nothing else is involved. I say here no reputable scientist would agree with that, but they're trying to keep that $1.5 billion a year flowing so they have to make CO2 into something that is dangerous, that is causing runaway global warming or catastrophic global warming in order to keep getting that money. Because if we weren't causing global warming, or even if we were and it was good or at least not dangerous, what would be the point of giving them one and a half billion dollars a year to study it? Then you've got the G7 leaders. This is a disgraceful situation where the leaders of the seven largest economies in the world agree to phase out fossil fuels by the end of the century. Even Prime Minister Stephen Harper, my former Prime Minister with his head bowed there, at least he has the grace to bow his head in shame, agreed to that. He's a conservative from Alberta, where the oil sands are, and he agrees to phase out fossil fuels in, a, in an international conference. There's something gone completely screwy with politics in the world these days for people saying such things. I've got a $10,000 U.S. bet on Twitter that CO2 emissions will be higher in 2025, 10 years from now, than they are today. And no green will take my bet. That's how much confidence they have in this so-called Paris Agreement that says everybody's going to lower their CO2. It's just a lot of window dressing and a lot of complete hypocrisy with these guys should all have to stand there naked like emperors who have no clothes because they're lying to us and they know it. The International Panel on Climate Change is a United Nations body which is often said to be the top scientific body on climate. It is a political organization of the United Nations. It is not a climate organization. They use climate scientists and climate science to justify their existence. Look at what their mandate is, Article 1.2. They are only required to consider changes in climate which are attributed to human activity that alters the atmosphere, nothing else. So they are automatically mandated by this clause, inherently conflicted to come down on the side of apocalypse. Because again, if they said 
climate was not mainly caused by people or that it wasn't dangerous because it's good to have a little bit of warming in this world, there would be no use for them. So they, have, they are automatically going to tell you this is a big problem and we've got to do a lot of stuff to solve it and you better keep giving us hundreds of millions of dollars a year for our giant UN apparatus. And here's what the public gets fed. There's not even a chance to stop this now. The catastrophe is upon us. We are doomed. That's what they're saying. The climate change nightmare is already here. Do you guys see it out there? You people see a climate change nightmare coming? Or is it just that the climate changes a little bit every year? Sometimes it's a good year. Sometimes it's a halfway as good year. And other times it's a crappy year. At least that's what it is for people growing plants. I don't know. Maybe with uh, pork it's a little better because you got them in, in a house and can control things a lot better than people growing photosynthetic stuff outdoors. Many opinions about climate change. 31,000 U.S. scientists and professionals say there's no convincing evidence that human CO2 will cause catastrophic heating. But the IPCC says it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of observed warming since the mid-20th century. Let's look at that sentence. Extremely likely. Does it make it more likely to put the word extremely in front of likely? What if it said very likely? That's actually what it said the last time. The time before that, their report said likely. So they are making it seem as though they're becoming more certain of the likelihood all the time. But the real problem here is the word likely itself. That is not a scientific term and in no way indicates that anything has been proven. Likely is an opinion, a judgment, like saying, in my opinion, that's what they're saying here. They're not saying they have proven anything. Has been the dominant cause. That means somewhere between 50 and 100 percent. That's a pretty big spread. They don't have a clue. How do they know it isn't 18 percent? They don't. Since the mid 20th century, that's 1950. So they're saying that in the last 65 years out of 4.6 billion years, Humans are now the main cause of the climate change on the Earth. I do not believe it because there is no proof of it. I'll show you what I mean. And then there's the late Michael Crichton, author of State of Fear. I'm certain there's too much certainty in the world. And I am certain he is right. As Yogi Berra said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> now here I'm going to try to use my mouse. Can you see my mouse there? Because um, point, two pointers is very difficult. I don't know where my mouse go. There it is. Does it disappear automatically if I don't move it? Uh, anyways, this is a, from here. Whoop. Why did that happen? From about here is where the Cambrian explosion began of modern life. Before that, all life was unicellular, microscopic, and confined to the oceans for three billion years. Suddenly, there was this proliferation of life forms, tissue differentiation, things with eyes, things with arms and legs, and all kinds of stuff happened. In a very short period of 50 million years, all the modern life forms emerged and have evolved since then. That was back here. This is CO2, the purple line, and the temperature line is blue. Does that look to you like a lockstep cause-effect relationship between temperature and CO2, where if temperature goes up, CO2 should go up, and if temperature goes down, CO2 should go down? Other way around, according to the pundits. They're saying CO2 is controlling temperature. How about right here, for example? Is that not them moving in exactly the opposite direction for 50 million years? And how about here? Temperature skyrockets to the warmest it's been in the history of the Earth, well, CO2 is dropping for 150 million years. CO temperature eventually starts to drop. But you don't know that it was the cause, the CO2 was the cause of that from a graph like this. We'll come back to this graph later. How about this? This shows that we are actually in a 50 million year cooling period. These are, we're fairly confident of these numbers in more recent history, 50 million years instead of 500. The Eocene thermal maximum shown here was one of the warmest, if not the warmest period in the last half billion years. 
Then the temperature started to go down. And here's where Antarctic glaciation began. But Arctic glaciation did not begin until here, only two and a half million years ago. Three and a half million years ago, giant camels roamed the Arctic islands of Canada in a forest. We know that for a fact. So we are not in a warming period in the Earth's climate. We are in a 50 million year cooling period. It's warmed a little bit in the last 300 years. It's also warmed over the last 12,000 years since the big glaciation retreated, but that was one of 20 or 50 glaciations that have occurred during the Pleistocene Ice Age, which we are still in. Then there's this. This is the longest temperature record by thermometer, actually measuring the temperature, rather than using proxies like isotopes of oxygen to figure out what the temperature was in the past. Here we're actually measuring the temperature in Middle England since 1670 or so, 1669. There's the black line is the curve of CO2 emissions per year by humans. Not the cumulative, but on an annual basis, how much is going out. Don't you think that if temperature followed CO2 in a cause-effect relationship, that the temperature curve would be going up exponentially as the CO2 goes up exponentially? At least a little bit? Because the temperature has actually been going up for 300 years, since the peak of the Little Ice Age, which was around 1700, which corresponded with the Monner minimum, which was a minimum in sunspots. We don't know if that was a cause-effect, but there it was. But it's been going up for 300 years. And we certainly weren't emitting enough CO2 300 years ago to cause the temperature to be going up continuously. Here is the last 150 years or so. Now, you, what the International Panel on Climate Change is saying is that this temperature rise is caused by humans. Then what caused this one from 1910 to 1930, bringing about the Dust Bowl and the really high temperatures back then in the 30s and 40s. What caused that? They don't say, because they don't know. How do they know what caused this wasn't the same thing that caused this? They don't. Right here you have a complete logical disconnect where how can they be so certain to say extremely likely that we caused the second little rise there when they don't know what caused the first one such a short time ago? And here's what's happening now. This is the last 18 years and seven months. The green line is the CO2 continuing to increase in annual emissions, whereas temperature, according to the satellites, there's two independent satellites measuring the temperature of the global atmosphere at all lat altitudes, plus a lot of balloons going up every day, giving a complete vertical profile of the temperature, much more reliable than land-based stations, which are influenced by the urban heat island effect of cities expanding and them not moving the station. This is what's going on in the actual atmosphere. And during this period, one third of all CO2 emissions have gone up into the atmosphere because of that exponential curve. And yet there is no increase in temperature during that period. Not far from you in Chicago, there was almost a kilometer of ice over top of that city, where that city is now at the peak of the last glaciation, between 18 and 20,000 years ago in that period. That's when it peaked. Montreal had 3.3, more than two miles of ice over top of it at that time. Now, from then till now, that is climate change. What we're experiencing now is nothing. It's just tiny little noise variations of half a degree or less going on year to year. This is the sea level rise that occurred from when the glaciers began to melt. Whoop, go back. From when the glaciers began to melt here until they had finished melting here. Since then, there has actually been, over the last 7,000 years, very little sea level rise, if any, net. Maybe it's just been going like this. That's why this happened, I think. This is one of thousands of islands at the equator in a calm tropical sea in Indonesia, which have been undercut by the lapping of the waves. How could that happen if the sea was rising? It would have gone above that by now, but it hasn't. 
So my belief is that even though the sea is rising slightly now, because we are in a 300-year warming period, that when we went into the Little Ice Age from the medieval warming period, which was a cooling period, the sea probably dropped. We do, we do know that the sea was higher during the medieval warm period than it is now, and higher in the last interglacial period than it is now. And this is kind of living proof that how can that happen in two years? It can't. It takes thousands of years for something like that to happen. That's solid rock. It is limestone, which is softer than granite, but granite wouldn't wear out like that in 7,000 years in that sea. Here is tropical cyclone energy on a global basis. It is not increasing. As a matter of fact, we're in a very quiet period for monsoons, typhoons, and hurricanes in the world right now. Interestingly, they say that last year was the hottest year on record since they started adjusting the numbers, is what that is about. But even if it was, it was also the least loss due to extreme weather events worldwide from an insurance point of view. It may be that just like the equatorial weather is calm most of the time, the really stormy parts of the world are the temperate regions between the polar cold and the equatorial hot. When the Earth warms, it warms more at the high latitudes than it does at the equator, thus reducing the temperature differential between the tropics and the poles, thus reducing the amount of energy that gets released in storms. So it may well be that as the Earth warms, if it ever does, substantially from the CO2, which I kind of doubt myself, that maybe we'll actually have calmer weather than we do now. Now to get to the nub of the matter. CO2 is the most important food for all life on Earth. Anybody who is in agriculture knows that, because that's what makes plants grow. That is their main food, along with water, Add a few minerals from the soil and sunlight, and you have growth. But without CO2, actually without CO2 at at least 150 parts per million, the plants would die. And this would be a dead planet if there wasn't CO2 in the atmosphere at a high enough level for plant growth. And everybody's worried. Boy, what happened there? It didn't show up. There's supposed to be a life-size mock-up of an ammonite there. It shows up on the slide here, but it doesn't show up there. Oh, anyways, it was a life-size ammonite that was about this big around, and it was growing in the sea by the millions at 2,000 ppm CO2. In other words, this whole ocean acidification thing they're telling us about, that the coral reefs are going to melt and all the shellfish are going to dissolve if CO2 goes up higher in the atmosphere, it's a total fabrication. CO2 has been way higher, as you saw in that early graph, than it is today through most of the history of life. And all those things didn't die. As a matter of fact, they flourished like these things. The beautiful ones there on the left are the coccolithophores. They're a plant, a phytoplankton, that is the basis for the food chain in the sea. And all the others, the foraminifera on the left is a little animal. All of these are calcifying organisms. Marine species learned to make calcium carbonate shells around themselves as a kind of armor plating half a billion years ago. And they've been doing that ever since. As a result of life learning to do this, there are today 100 million billion tons of carbonaceous rocks in the Earth's crust, all of life origin from pulling carbon out of the air into the sea into shells. It's been a long time, half a billion years, and, and th this is, here is the, the 10 billion, ton, billion tons of carbon we're putting into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels every year, and here is the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, 850 billion tons, and all these red things are flows on an annual basis. The, C the carbon we are putting into the atmosphere is new carbon. We are taking it from buried fossil fuels, which have been there for 100 million years or so, and putting it back into the annual carbon cycle. The other red things there are just annual cycles that go on every year. There's no new carbon coming into the system there. It's the carbon that's already in the system. But we are adding new carbon to the system and therefore having a considerable effect on the atmospheric level of CO2. 
This is what's been happening to the atmospheric level of CO2 on an average since the last half billion years. A steady downward trend, and you can really see it in this last 150 million years. This little uptick is what we've done at the end here. If this line had continued to go down to levels like this, which it did at the height of the last glaciation, 180 ppm, 150 is the threshold for plant growth, and we have evidence from pollen and tree rings back at that time that plants more or less stopped growing at 180 ppm, very slow growth. Take it down further, they would die. So, if we hadn't come along and caused this rise from 280 to 400, which it's at today, it would have continued to fall until during a major glaciation, less than two million years from now, life on Earth would begin to die because the calcifiers in the sea would continue to pull carbon out of the system and put it into the deep sediments. This is my hypothesis, that humans are the salvation of living creation on the Earth in the same way that a little fungus was way back in history. You see here, when the CO2 fell precipitously like this, more faster than it has ever in the history of the Earth, this was because trees sucked the carbon out of the atmosphere and fell dead on top of each other for 100 million years because there was nothing that could digest wood. Wood was new when trees evolved, lignin in particular. There was no lignin in the world until trees evolved and used it like a concrete column to grow up higher into the sunlight. No decomposer could digest wood. That's where the coal came from. A hundred million years of wood, of trees piling up on top of each other, pulling the carbon out of the atmosphere, because wood is 50% carbon from CO2. When the fungus evolved the enzymes to digest lignin, you can see that CO2 came rising back up again and back up again. So it recovered some of the carbon in the atmosphere by digesting the wood. But it didn't get it back up to where it had been because now the whole world was covered in forests, which represents a huge amount of carbon. Then it started going down again here, which is the calcium carbonate growing on marine shells and coral reefs. A huge volume every year is being lost to the atmosphere. Therefore, life would have started coming to an end if we hadn't intervened. So we are not the enemies of nature. Just like that fungus intervened before the trees had sucked all the carbon out of the atmosphere and started digesting them and putting the CO2 back, we are now putting CO2 back and helping to rebalance the carbon cycle. That steady downward trend in CO2 is not balanced. Balanced would be steady. We're going to bring it back up to a new steady state that will be better for life on Earth. Why do I know that? Because in greenhouses and also in open fields, CO2 fertilization results in doubling and tripling the growth of trees and food crop plants. That's why greenhouse growers purposefully put CO2 into their greenhouse to increase the productivity in there, 50 to 100 percent in some cases. And we have absolutely certain scientific knowledge that our CO2 emissions are greening the earth by fertilizing the plants. Carbon dioxide is one of the main limiting factors in plant growth on planet earth. If you are a farmer and you are giving your plants enough water and enough nutrients and enough sunlight, then carbon dioxide will be the limiting factor. If you added more CO2, you would get fast, faster growth. There's simply no doubt about it, and we've ignored this all these years. But it's a fact. That's my case. Now we'll talk about energy for a bit. 88% of world energy is produced by fossil fuels. The Greens are against fracking natural gas. They're against coal. They're against oil. They're against nuclear energy. And they're against hydroelectric dams. They are against all but 1.3% of the energy that manages to keep our civilization going every day. Who would buy into that agenda? 
Well, unfortunately, a percentage of the humans do for some reason and think we can actually run our economies on wind and solar and other renewables alone, except for hydroelectricity. We don't like that, even though it is by far the largest source of renewable electricity. Fact of the matter is, fossil fuels are 100% organic, according to the scientific meaning of organic, not the hocus-pocus meaning of organic in agriculture. The scientific meaning, which is called organic chemistry, it means the chemistry of carbon. All other chemistry is called inorganic chemistry. But the chemistry of carbon is called organic chemistry because it is the chemistry of life. It is produced with solar energy. All those fossil fuels were produced with solar energy, renewable energy. What do they make solar panels with? Coal-fired power plant electricity. Oh, it's renewable, so maybe that's not so bad. But they act like they're holier than thou and that coal is awful, and actually that's what's used to make the solar panels in China and Taiwan. When burned, fossil fuels produce carbon dioxide and water is the two main things, the most important two food for life to make sugar in plants. And they are the largest storage battery of solar energy on Earth, the fossil fuels. That is sequestration, capture and sequestration. That's what the fossil fuels are. Everybody is saying that's a good thing to do to capture the CO2 and put it in the ground. Well, we're taking it out of the ground and putting it back into the air, which I think is the best thing to do because too much of it had been lost to the carbon cycle already. And as I mentioned, hydroelectric supplies 20% of global electricity, and yet these guys are against it. They stopped the World Bank from funding the Three Gorges Dam in China because they said it was a bad thing to build. Thankfully, that we buy enough flat screen TVs from these guys that they could afford to do it by themselves without the World Bank helping. This dam replaces 40 coal-fired power plants, prevents thousands of deaths downstream where farmers are farming on the floodplains to grow the food, allows two times as much land to be irrigated because now they can control the water. This is a sustainable development. It satisfies environmental, social, and economic needs and yet they're against it. Nuclear energy will be the most important source of electricity in the future when long from now we start to get fossil fuels being scarce. Don't worry about peak oil just yet. It's not going to happen until beyond our grandchildren's lifetime probably. But it will happen someday in the far distant future. And when, you know, we, don't, we don't think of nuclear as being so important because we have a flood of fossil fuels right now, a glut of fossil fuels almost because of the shale revolution. But in the future, there's fuel for thousands of years with nuclear energy. The fuel for nuclear is far more sustainable than fossil fuels in terms of the supply. 20 countries produce 15% or more of their electricity by nuclear energy. My country, Canada, is one of those. And so is the United States. And most of them are in Europe, actually. Everybody thinks Europe is getting out of nuclear. That's just Germany. Everybody else is getting into nuclear. And they say it's nuclear waste, but in fact, it's one of the most important fuels for the future. 98% of the energy is still in that used nuclear fuel. Russia has built the fast neutron reactors on the Caspian Sea that use it. They just sold two to China. And everybody in the West is, I don't know what the problem is, the United States had one of these in Washington State, the Fast Flux Test Facility. Clinton shut it down in 93 or 4, and it's never been brought back since. The United States is way behind in advanced nuclear technology. The Russians are the leaders today. Photovoltaic panels. I have a full solar system off the grid in Baja. I know how much it costs to produce solar electricity. Because when you're off the grid, you also have to have batteries for the nighttime when there isn't too much sun. And then it costs you about 75 cents to a dollar per kilowatt hour. And you have to check it three times a day. And you have to replace the batteries every five to eight years, depending on how careful you are with them, because it takes a lot of maintenance. And as I pointed out, these solar panels are produced with coal-fired power in China and Taiwan, largely. I say there should be a law that you have to use solar and wind energy to produce solar panels and wind turbines. Then we'd see how long this would last, this foolishness. 
This is a cost-effective use of solar energy, heating water. It's a good thing right here in Iowa, anywhere it's sunny, you're going to find that it works. Save you at least 50 percent of your gas bill on water heating. Get a geothermal heat pump and you'll do even better. How many people here have geothermal heat pumps? Well done. It's taken on. It's coming on. It's just the cheap gas makes it difficult for people to rationalize the upfront capital cost of geothermal, but it, it is a far more efficient system, and it, if you're using electricity that's fired with nuclear, hydro, or renewables, then you got no CO2 if you care about that. It's just that it's an elegant system is why I support it. Wind is for wealthy wasters. <laughs> solar and wind, the subsidies for solar and wind, the crony capitalism involved in this, and even many Republicans in states that have a lot of wind now are, you know, they're supporting it because it's bringing all kinds of money into their state, but it's bringing it to the rich people who are getting richer. This is one of the biggest transfers of wealth from the poor to the rich in the history of the world. It's absolutely opposite of Robin Hood. They are taking a little bit of money from everybody and concentrating it in the pockets of a few wealthy wind and solar owners who are guaranteed a 20-year profit with no risk to their business. It's guaranteed money. And there's something really wrong with that. That is such a twisting of the system that the United States, I mean, I've always said the United States is the world example, leading example of social Darwinism. In other words, survival of the fittest. But this is the exact opposite of that. This is survival of the subsidized. Here's what happens when you put in wind. One day you got 12,000 megawatts, this is Germany. The next day you got nothing. What do you do on the nothing day? Send everybody home? No, there's no electricity there either. You build a coal plant, which you might as well have built in the first place, because then you wouldn't need the wind turbines, because they're actually reliable. Here's Greenpeace protesting a Russian oil platform with an oil-powered ship saying we must end our addiction to oil. Meanwhile, they go back to the dock and fuel up on a BP diesel oil tanker. The word starts with H. Hypocrite. It's all these people telling us to do what we should do that they don't do. Leonardo DiCaprio and Neil Young and all these people are telling us that we should stop using fossil fuels and go back to what? Mud huts? Hoeing our weeds in the front yard there, a little plot of vegetables? Is that what we're supposed to do and not go anywhere? I've been to Africa. I don't want to live like that. I've seen how people are living in the country there with no water, no sanitation, not a very good diet, and they still die young, unlike the people in countries where they have good nutrition, sanitation, health care, etc. This is our oil sands up in Canada there. They say that the oil sands is destroying the boreal forest of Canada. It's like a pimple on an elephant. The boreal forest of Canada is very large, and the oil sands are very small in comparison to it. And when are they going to reclaim Edmonton nearby, the city of Edmonton? Are they going to reclaim Des Moines, turn it back into a native ecosystem, get rid of all the people out of the urban culture? No. In the oil sands, though, which looks kind of ugly when they start digging it up, it looks like a coal mine, to tell you the truth, an open pit coal, open cast coal mine, it looks no different, except it's oil on sand rather than coal. And the reason they're doing this is so they can clean the oil off the sand and put the clean sand back where the dirty sand was. At least they like to call it dirty. It's dirty oil, they say. Like as if, they, what they mean is dirty like in Dirty Rotten Scoundrel. They don't mean dirty as in dirt, because dirt's where we grow food. There's nothing wrong with dirt. You know, when you get it on your pants, you say your pants are dirty. But that doesn't mean it's like poison or something. So they're, they're doing this dirty oil. We don't want your dirty oil all around the world is the propaganda that they're putting out. But actually, after they do this and make a profit at it to boot, uh, well, I don't know about right now with the price of oil, but they were making a profit and will again one day. They got to bide their time, uh, but there's what it looks like when they're mining, and there's what it looks like when they're finished, because it is a law that every square inch of disturbed land in the oil sands must be returned to native boreal ecosystem with bison grazing, 
on what was a tailings pond where the clean sand was put back and has been revegetated. And First Nations, what we call American Indians, are growing these bison, looking after these bison under contract. The oil sands employs more First Nations people than any other industry in Canada and puts $85 million a year into First Nations corporations along with all the hundreds of people that they've hired to do the work in the oil sands as workers. This is what they do. They plant trees back in the ecosystem to make it completely sustainable. Nobody has to do anything here. Nobody has to come and tend this. It will grow back by itself with these native species. After 45 years as an ecologist and environmental activist, this is good enough for me. I don't see what's wrong with that. The land is opened up for a microsecond in geological time to get the oil off the sand and put it back cleaner and make a profit, providing fuel for the economy, all our vehicles, and then they do this. I have one more little section. It's about golden rice. This is the health part of my presentation. Vitamin A deficiency kills more children than any other affliction in the world, and it is not a disease like malaria or HIV AIDS, which also kill a lot of children. It is simply a deficiency of vitamin A, an essential nutrient. It is, however, a genetically modified form of rice because there was no other way that scientists could figure to get beta carotene, which we make vitamin A from, into rice. So they used this new technology of genetics. Now, genetic modification is actually a very misunderstood term. Every single one of us in this room, of course, is genetically modified. Because we are not identical to our parents, we are a random mixture of their genes which produces a unique new individual that is modified genetically. And there are many ways to modify the genetics of species. High-level radiation is one of them, radiation mutation. All our pasta wheat, the durum wheat, was made with radiation mutation. Chemical mutation with mutagenic chemicals like colchicine will scramble the DNA, and you plant a million seeds that have been put in the chemical and see if anything interesting comes up. It's a very shotgun approach. And then there's transgenic DNA, recombinant DNA technology, what we call gen genetic modification these days. It's actually horizontal gene transfer. It's been going on in nature for billions of years, not millions, billions. Bacteria, just like we do, have been taking bits of DNA from one species to another since the beginning of life. That's what chloroplasts, mitochondria, and the nucleus in our cells are, are species of bacteria that got in there and it turned out to be a symbiotic relationship, so it perpetuated itself. So this has been going on forever. We've just learned how to do it now, to use bacteria to take specific pieces of genetic material, like the gene from corn that causes corn to put beta carotene into the kernel, and magic. You put it in rice plants, and it causes rice to put beta carotene into the grain, just like that. Now, they say that GM is a bad thing, but actually all these organizations say it's safe. There is a total consensus, unlike with climate change, where there's quite a big controversy around it. They manufacture the consensus, but it's not really true. But there's a big division in the climate debate. There is no big division in the science community on genetic modification. It's said to be safe by all these and many other organizations. And it's been taken up around the world by 28 countries, 17 million farmers, on about 12% of the total arable farmland in the world. And the only reason it isn't 50% is because of irrational bans and restrictions like the whole of the EU banning the growth of GM crops for no good reason other than, well, there's trade reasons and there's superstitious reasons and there's political reasons, but there's no science reason. It's been very useful for the countries that have adopted it. In the Philippines, where in order to try to win the debate politically, Greenpeace said that there would be dying children and cancer clusters 
if Bt corn was allowed in, the farmers beat them and convinced the government to let it in, and now they've really reduced their pesticide use on corn as they have everywhere that they've adopted these insect-resistant varieties of corn and other crops. And here in Bangladesh, myself, my wife Eileen, and a PhD student with the Bangladeshi farmer that is growing the newly approved BT eggplant, or brinjal as they call it there, the, the Bangladeshi government is really a very modern in their thinking on GM. They're going to be the first, I believe, to approve golden rice. Finally, someone will approve golden rice. You see, I'll get to it. I'm, st I'm still in the sort of general area of GM, of course, here. India, Indian farmers forced their government to introduce, to legalize BT cotton. Actually, Prime Minister Modi was the governor of Gujarat, which was the state that allowed the first GM crop into India. He supports it. Unfortunately, he's got a lot of traditionalists and different kind of people in his government. It's going to be hard for him, but he is going to try to push for opening up because India has one GM crop, cotton. Philippines has one GM crop, corn. Bangladesh has one GM crop, eggplants. What the heck sense is that? Why don't they at least all three of them have all three? If it's good for one and not for the other, that's ridiculous. But that's the way it is politically. Here's how it is economically. This is a meta study of all GM crop production around the world showing that the yield goes up 21% and the profit goes up 68%. Meanwhile, pesticide cost and quantity goes down by a substantial amount. This is why farmers buy those seeds. But here we are with a map of vitamin A deficiency in preschool children. We're talking two million deaths a year in preschool children through vitamin A deficiency, and many of them, up to half a million, go blind before they die. Vitamin A is not only necessary for your eyesight, it's necessary for your immune system. The reason two million die is because they die from diarrhea, dengue, malaria, and other diseases that a healthy child with a healthy immune system would live through. But they don't because their immune systems are compromised in a somewhat similar way to what HIV AIDS does, immunodeficiency. Here are the organizations involved with the development of golden rice. It includes the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who are the main funders today. If there's one bright light in international aid, it's certainly them and their support from Warren Buffett and the other billionaires to professionalize international aid. And it's not just a goody two-shoes thing for them. They're actually, and of course, Greenpeace calls it corporatizing international aid. What it means is they actually have an executive structure with people who know what they're doing. And they are delivering international aid in agriculture, medicine, and other fields around the world now, especially in Africa and Asia, and they're the main funders of this wonderful work. If golden rice was a medicine that would cure Ebola, HIV AIDS, or malaria, it would have been approved at least 10 years ago, five years after it was invented. If somebody invented a cure for malaria today that you just had to take a pill and it would prevent malaria or cure malaria, and it was proven on human subjects in a six-month trial, you don't think that would be approved? And this isn't even a medicine. A medicine is usually something that's poisonous to a disease agent. And the trick is to make sure you poison the disease and not the patient. Where, like chemotherapy, for example, is a classic case of that. Whereas vitamin A is an essential nutrient. It's not as if you're giving the kids a poison, you're giving them something they need to survive. And yet Greenpeace and others are against it. Here's the field trial of golden rice, and here's the activists promoted by Greenpeace from left-wing organizations in the Philippines destroying the government-sponsored golden rice field trials at the International Rice Research Institute paid for by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They have the nerve to do this because they're zealots and nutcases mostly. But that's what they do. And they go around in the streets with golden rice associated with the skull and crossbones to scare mothers and fathers into thinking that if they eventually feed golden rice to their children, it will kill them. Instead of what it will really do 
And these are uneducated people largely, especially in the agricultural community in third world countries. They don't have a chance to go to school because they've got to work from when they're eight years old in the fields. This is Greenpeace's description of golden rice. Golden rice illusion, fake remedy for vitamin A deficiency. And here's the nastiest person of all, Vandana Shiva, who looks all nice and mama like Mother Earth, but she is a cult leader in India who claims to have credentials but does not, who says farmers who grow GMOs is like saying rapists should have the freedom to rape. So she uses these kind of extremely emotional and sensational words associating with GMO. She says a quarter of, more than a quarter of a million Indian farmers have committed suicide since Monsanto entered the in Indian seed market. It's genocide. Actually, you can see from this chart that when GM cotton was introduced in India, production has doubled and the farmers are much better off. You can also see that since that time, suicide rates have generally gone down in farmers. Now that seems like a lot, like 150,000 or something, right? But actually, India has like 500 million farmers. So percentage-wise, she's just lying through her teeth because India has a lower suicide rate than the United States. And suicides in India are much higher in the cities where people are stressed than they are on the farms where people are living a little slower paced life, watching their crops grow. So there you have the kind of propaganda that's going around. Here's Tony with the amount of golden rice needed to keep a child from going blind and dying each day. It's a tiny little bit. And there's no reason why this rice won't be exactly the same price as regular rice because there will be no license fee for the GM trait. It's all been given away by Monsanto and Syngenta and the others who've been involved. There's about seven companies who've all given it for free for developing countries, which is the only place where the problem exists. What does Greenpeace say? That golden rice is a Trojan horse for GMOs. Oh no, golden rice might make GMOs look useful for human health. So they don't want that to happen. In other words, they want the two million kids to keep dying every year for 15 years since this was invented. The blood of those kids is on their hands because they are the opposition out of a $400 million organization based in the Netherlands and Hamburg, Germany, where most of the money comes from. Trojan horse, they say. I, I'm thinking, wow, I think I'll get in the horse and take the scientist with me and anybody else who wants to come and get in that horse because I know who that battle was won by the people in the horse they won that battle so let's all get in the Trojan horse and beat Greenpeace at this one finally and Bangladesh I guarantee it will end up being a world leader in this last slide here we are with the first demonstration against Greenpeace on the Golden Rice campaign. Allow Golden Rice now. Here we were saying 8 million children dead when we started. It's more like 12 now. This was a family enterprise from the start and it's grown into quite a large campaign. There at the first campaign is my nephew, Ariel, my son, John, my brother, Michael, my wife, Eileen's in the background and I'm taking the picture. And uh, since then, we've had three tours in Europe and exposed 30 million plus people to a positive message about golden rice. And last year, a big tour through South Asia, ending up in India and in Delhi and Mumbai with big press conferences explaining golden rice to the media and to the science community there. And we say allow golden rice now. And we also say celebrate CO2. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>